National Bank of Indianapolis, Indiana. He uh, received his Bachelor of Arts degree in Business and Finance in 1968 from Bellarmine College. After a short stint in the Air Force, he joined the Mobile Oil Corporation as the marketing manager. After three moves and a year and a half, he decided to leave Mobile Oil and join Indiana National Bank. Since joining the bank, he continued his education, earning a Master's of Business Administration from Indiana University in 1976 and a graduate degree in banking from Rutgers University in 1983. Prior to his present assignment at Indiana National, he was head of the bank's Small Business and Services Group, responsible for the management of small business lending and advisory services. Because of his outstanding work in that area, the Small Business Administration named him Banker of the Year for the State of Indiana in both 1980 and 1984. He was the Chairman of the Indiana Small Business Advisory Council during 1981 and 1982. He is the Founder and President of the Indiana Statewide Certified Development Corporation, which is the fourth largest of the 400 certified development corporations in the United States. He is the president and co-founder of the Venture Club of Indiana Incorporation, the second largest venture club in the country. He is a member of the Enterprise Advisory Council, Indiana Institute for New Business Ventures, and in addition, he is the chairman of the Indianapolis Chamber of Commerce Education Committee. It is evident from this brief and abbreviated introduction that he is quite familiar with entrepreneurship and small business administration. Hence, it is with a great deal of pleasure I present to you Mr. Stephen J. Beck speaking on small businesses as a key to economic development for local communities. Well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I think the topic of small business is an important topic, and it's one that until recently most people simply gave lip service to, truly didn't understand it, its importance. Small business represents an important part of the American economy. The efforts of men and women who operate small businesses are vital to the nation's economy. About 40% of the private sector employment is small, independently owned businesses. Small and medium-sized firms are important sources of product and process innovation. Small business efforts provide needed flexibility for our economy to meet the foreign competition in changing economic realities. Growing small businesses <clears throat> also bring enormous advantages to our society. For example, three companies, Apple, Hewlett Packard, and Texas Instruments, who were virtually non-existent in their present state 25 years ago, are now major corporations. They have introduced new products and services and have greatly strengthened the U.S. trade position because of their significant exports. These corporations have experienced annual sales growth of about 17 percent in, in the way of jobs and 11 percent uh, actual compounded sales growth during a period when the average gross national product has increased by two and a half percent. Probably the most important areas where small and medium-sized businesses have the greatest impact are job creation and innovation and in addition to that the development of good well-rounded innovative people. First I want to talk a couple minutes about the topic of job creation. Where have all the jobs gone? That's been a constant question that's <clears throat> been asked over and over again in the Western society over the last few years. But for the U.S., another question is at least as important, if not more important, than that. And that's where have all the jobs come from? All developed industrial countries are losing jobs in the smokestack industry, even Japan. But only the U.S. economy is creating new jobs at a much faster rate than the old jobs are being lost indeed at a rate that is almost unprecedented in recent history. Between 1965 and 1984, the American population between the ages 16 and 65 grew by 38 percent to 178 million from 129 million. But jobs during that same period increased 45 percent from 103, <coughs> 203 million from 71 million. By the fall of 1984, that number had reached somewhere between 105 and 106 million jobs in the United States, <clears throat> which would mean that that's a rise of 50 percent since 1965. More than half of this growth occurred since the energy crisis in the fall of 1973, a period when we had oil shocks, two recessions, 
and a near collapse of the smokestacks industries in the United States. Indeed, in 1981 and 1982, for all its traumas, the job creation by the small business sector barely slowed down. At, at its bottom in the fall of 1982, there were 15 million more jobs than there had been 10 years pr prior to that, despite record unemployment. In Japan, as an example, jobs <coughs> over the last 10 years have grown by 10 percent, only half as fast as they, as they have risen in the United States. Western Europe has actually had job shrinkage. In Western Europe, there are now 3 million fewer jobs available than there were five years ago, even when, taken, when, when cyclical unemployment adjustments have been made. That's a significant reduction, 3 million jobs. In the U.S., the U.S. economy now has 15 million more jobs than even most optimists thought we would have 15 years ago. When you take a look at people such as, as Eli Ginsberg, who is from Columbia University and one of the probably uh, the best studiers of the impact in job creation in the United States, he predicted approximately 15 years ago that the U.S. economy would be lucky to meet the, the need for the baby boomers over a 10-year period. <clears throat> when you take a look what has happened over that same time frame, we have increased jobs by 50 percent more than what we anticipated just in order to, to offset the phenomena that we hadn't expected, wives coming into the marketplace. The, the massive impact of women on our economy today. They did not come from the, <clears throat> the sector where, where we typically had decreases in jobs over the last 40 years. The big companies and government. Government stopped expanding its employment in early 1970s and has barely maintained it since. Big business has been losing employment since the early 1970s. In the past five years alone, the Fortune 500, those companies which are the largest Comp employers in the United States have lost approximately three million jobs. Nearly all job creation has been in small and medium-sized businesses, and practically all of it in entrepreneurial and innovative businesses. Ah, most people say, high tech. But things are not quite that simple. Of the 40 million plus jobs created since 1965 in the economy, <clears throat> high tech did not contribute more than five or six million. High tech thus contributes no more than what the, off, what the smokestack industries have lost. All the additional jobs in the economy were generated elsewhere. And only about one or two percent of, out of every 100,000 new companies that are generated are high tech oriented. That's only about 10,000 jobs, 10,000 businesses over the last <clears throat> 10 years or so that have been high tech oriented. There is no doubt that high tech, whether in the form of computers or telecommunications, robots on the manufacturing floor or office automation, biogenetics or engineering, is of immeasurable quantitative importance. High tech provides the, ex the excitement in the headlines. It creates the vision for entrepreneurs and innovation in the community, and the receptivity for entrepreneurship. The willingness of young, high-trained people to go to work for small and unknown employers, rather than for giant banks or worldwide electrical manufacturers of equipment, is surely rooted in the mystique of high tech. Even though the overwhelming majority of those young people work for employers whose technology is either commonplace and mundane, high tech also probably, probably stimulated the astonishing transformation of the American capital market from an absence of venture capital prior to 1978 to an overabundance today. <clears throat> in Indiana alone, since 1981, we have gone from no venture capital in the state to right now a pool of somewhere between 60 and 70 million dollars. That's a tremendous change in a period of four years and has a significant impact on entrepreneur and new businesses in, in Indiana. <clears throat> Again, where did all the jobs come from? The answer is from everywhere and nowhere. In other words, from no single source. <clears throat> the magazine Inc., which is published in Boston, has printed each year since 1982 a list of the 100 fastest growing publicly owned American companies more than five years old and less than, and less than 15 years old. <clears throat> Being confined to publicly owned companies, the list is heavily biased towards high technology, which has easy access to underwriters, to stock market money, and to being traded on one of the, stock, the major stock markets or over the counter. High tech is fashionable. 
Other new ventures, as a rule, cannot go public only after a long period of sustained profit and growth. Yet, only one quarter of the Inc.'s 100 are high tech. Three quarters remain decidedly low tech year after year. In 1982, for instance, there were five restaurant chains, two women's wear manufacturers, and 20 health care providers on that list. But only 20 of the fastest growing companies in this country, publicly held companies, were high tech. And whilst the American newspapers in 1982 ran one article after another bemoaning the deindustrialization de of America, a full half of the ink firms were manufacturing companies. Only one third were in the service industries. Although the word had it in 1982 that the, that the frost belt was dying, or perhaps all already dead, one third of the Inc. 100 companies in that year were in, the, were in the sun belt. That means the other two thirds were someplace else. New York had as many of these fast growing young publicly owned companies as California or Texas. In Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Massachusetts, which are supposedly already dead, they had as many new fast growing companies as California or Texas and as many as New York. Places such as Minnesota and Illinois had seven, and Indiana actually had one. The ink list in 1983 and 84 showed a very similar distribution in respect to these companies, both in, for, as far as industry and geography. And the new list that came out not too long ago for 1985 basically shows the same thing. In 1983, the first and second companies on another ink list the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing young privately held <coughs> companies were first a building contractor from the Pacific Northwest. And that's at a time when the construction industry was supposedly at its worst place in the last 50 years. The second fastest growing was a phys physical exercise e equipment manufacturer for homes. Neither of these you can consider high tech. Any inquiry among venture capitalists <coughs> will tell you the same thing. Indeed, their portfolio does have some high-tech companies in it, but the vast majority of these companies <coughs> in their portfolios are non-high-tech. <coughs> One venture capitalist that I happen to know relatively well that's out in California gave me a summary of what their portfolio happens to look like. <coughs> and they do have a couple of high-tech. They have one uh, computer software producer and another company in medical technology. However, the fastest growing company in their portfolio in both revenues <coughs> and profitability during the period 1981 to 84 was of all things a chain of barber shops. Not high tech. And next to it, both in sales and profitability, came a, came, a chain, came a chain of dentistry offices. Again, not high tech. Followed, by, followed then by a manufacturer of hand tools and a small finance company that, that, that leased machinery to small businesses. The most revealing source of information about the growth sector in the U.S. economy that I've been able to find is a study of the 100 fastest growing medium-sized companies. Those are companies that have sales of somewhere between 20 and 40 million dollars. This study was, con was conducted in 1981, between 1981 and 1983 uh, for the American Business Conference by two partners of McKinsey & Company, uh, the consulting firm. These medium-sized companies grew at three times the rate of the Fortune 500 in both sales and profitability. The Fortune 500 has been losing jobs steadily since 1970, but these medium-sized companies added jobs between 1970 and 83 at three times the rate of the U.S. economy as a whole. Even in the recessionary years of 1981 and 82, where the U.S. economy lost employment of approximately 2 percent, these companies had a net increase in employment of 1 percent. So they had a 3% difference between their growth rate and that of the Fortune 500 or the big employers. These companies span the economic spectrum. There are high-tech ones, but the majority of them are low-tech. As an example, the fastest growing is a company that sells living room furniture. Another uh, markets donuts. The third, a high-quality chinaware company. The fourth, writing instruments. The fifth fastest household paints. The sixth uh, used to be a, a company that printed local newspapers, but now is in consumer marketing, direct, direct mail basically. The seventh fastest is a producer of yarn for textile and so forth. Pretty much low tech. Again, <clears throat> where everybody knows that the American economy is exclusively in service, 
only a, a half of these firms, or more than a half of these firms, were manufacturing. So a lot of the things that we hear over and over again, that the American economy is moving towards service, it's going towards high tech, I think the people that are they're, uh, proponents of these things haven't really looked at the information. Again, who generates the new jobs? One misconception on the job <coughs> generation issue is that all small business firms generate new jobs. Unfortunately, that's not true. According to three independent studies, one by the Brookings Institute, another by MIT, and another by the University of California, which was conducted between the years 1969 and 1980, so there's a good time frame that they could study, only a fraction, about 12 to 15 percent of all the small businesses in the United States were truly responsible for the job creation. The path by which the economy grows is one of violent growth in the majority of businesses contrasted with the stability in the majority of businesses. The study which was done by the Brookings Institute showed that in two-thirds of all the companies they studied in the time frame of 1978 to 1980, two-thirds of those companies showed no growth whatsoever in employment. So it was one-third of the companies in their study that truly had all the growth in jobs. As Peter Drucker says, small business is the lifeblood of job generation in the United States. <clears throat> I brought with me, I'm a proponent of Peter Drucker, and I don't get any commission for his book, okay? But he has a new book that came out this past spring called Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And, and um, I think it's one of the best books that I have read in a long time. And I would suggest to you that if you haven't read it, you either buy it and read it, go to the library and read it, or whatever. Because what it does is it basically, as, P, as I found Peter, nobody but Peter Drucker has the ability to do, he doesn't come up with any new ideas. What he does do, however, is he takes a lot of ideas that are out there and puts them in a format and shows that entrepreneurship is a learned skill. That no one, one night while they were asleep, had the good Lord come down and put his hands over their head and say, you are an entrepreneur, you will be successful. And most entrepreneurs basically take the same basic skills and put it into a format and learn a great deal from it. And this book, I think, shows you the format and shows you very easily that you can be a success if you know what you're doing. I guess that's the same in most, most fields. The second area where small business plays a significant role is in that of innovation in our society. Small businesses play an important role in originating new products and processes. The ability to innovate is frequently cited, cited by commentators and policymakers as the essential rationale for focus, focusing attention on small business. Precise measurement, measurement and description of small business contributions to innovation is an ongoing pursuit. More people study new innovation by big companies, little companies, medium-sized companies than anything I've found in a long time. Small businesses have been the idea generators and risk takers for most innovations. In excess of 94% of all patents that are issued are issued to companies of less than 100 employees, small businesses. These innovations, these innovative small businesses are found across industries, but public attention is normally focused on them when they have a big hit, when either they have a significant uh, new product or invention, or when they have a significant growth, such as Apple Computer. In recent years, additional attention has been created on a new class of small technology-based firms. These firms are found in industries <coughs> that are characterized by an above average concentration of scientists and engineers, high levels of research and development expenditures, and a continual involvement in the dynamics of innovation. I'm going to list just a few of the things that have been invented that affect you every day. I guarantee you every one of these items today you were affected by, and they were all invented not by General Motors <coughs> or not by the major corporations, but by companies of less than 50 employees. Things like the aerosol can. If any of you use deodorant or hairspray today, you probably used it. Air conditioning. Maybe you didn't use it today, but you used it sometime during the summer. Airplanes. Artificial skin. Now, that's probably one you didn't use. But if you used a band-aid, that, that was, a, it was a, in fact, uh, invented by a small company. <coughs> Catalytic petroleum cracking. The process by which you make gasoline. If you came here in a car today, you used that, that particular process. Uh, fiber optics. If you use the telephone today, you probably used it. The heart valve. There might be somebody in this room that might have had open heart surgery and might have been affected by that. Helicopters. 
large capacity computers. You know, all of us almost every day anymore use computers. If you use a telephone, you use a computer, whether you know it or not. <clears throat> Overnight national delivery. How many of you use Federal Express or Purolator? Small business. Uh, if you go back and look at Federal Express, all the academia said it would never work. He got a C, the, when, when, when Fred Brown wrote his thesis on that company, he got a C plus for effort. But his professor told him there wasn't a chance that it would ever work. Uh, the personal computer, the Polaroid camera, the, the safety razor, the soft contact lens, vacuum tubes, xerography, the zipper. Where would we be without the zipper? <laughs> Where would we be without the zipper? That's an interesting story by itself. We could spend a half hour talking about that. <clears throat> and these are only <clears throat> a few of the, the ones that I found to date are almost four thousand innovations that we use on a regular basis that come from small businesses. There's a great deal of evidence to suggest that the small businesses are effective performers of innovation. One of the most extensive studies covers 635 products uh, marketed in the, uni in the United States during the 1970s, which, which represent 121 different industries. Forty percent are 226 firms of the 563 firms which could be identified were attributed to small businesses. Now these were 226 significant innovations, not just basic innovations, because there's a lot of innovations you can't find. They're out there someplace and they're hard to test. But over 40 percent of the new innovations in the, 19, the decade of the 1970s came from companies of less than 100 employees. That's very significant. An important dis discovery of this study is that small businesses contribute a disproportionate large share of innovation and bring these products to the marketplace much faster than do big businesses. This study also shows <clears throat> that the incidence of innovation for employees of small businesses is significantly larger than that of large companies. Firm, uh, small firms produce two and a half times as many innovations as large companies two and a half times as many innovations as large companies. I think that's extremely significant. A study by the Gelman Research Associates found that the time necessary to bring an innovation to the market averaged 2.2 years for small firms compared to 3.05 years for large firms. Small firms take less time to carry out each of the several activities performed at various stages of innovation from the establishment of performance criteria uh, to the actual production to the marketing of a product. A similar study on the use of patents in new technology shows that small businesses were able to introduce new product improvements in less than 12 months and new innovations in less than two years. Large firms, on the other hand, at least the ones uh, that were in this study, consistently took a year and a half for new processes and about three years, three to three and a half years, depending on which study, to come out with new products. So new com or small companies can react much quicker to the marketplace and come out with new products a lot faster. These studies indicate that small and medium-sized businesses are of major importance to the U.S. economy. The creation of new employment and, innova and innovative technology in the United States would not happen as, at its present pace if it were not for small and medium-sized businesses. The third area where I think small business has real significance is the training of people. When you study small business, and you study successful businesses, there typically comes, you can focus on four areas where most small businesses seem to excel. First off is most good small businesses, and I emphasize the word good, are planners rather than reactors. Now planning, depending upon how detailed you get in it, can be as rudimentary as looking at the checkbook a week in advance and asking yourself the question, do you have enough money to make, the, make your payroll? But most good small businesses do do a good job of planning and are doing a much better job of planning today than as recently as three or four years ago because small business people recognize what, what helps them to succeed and they change very quickly. Another thing that small businesses help people to do is become extremely flexible. They become very flexible. If you read the book and we were talking about it at dinner, In Search of Excellence, that seems to be one thing that they talk about consistently, that in order to be successful, you have to be flexible. Small businesses teach, <coughs> teach their people to be flexible. 
The third thing is to be successful, you have to be creative. And if any of you have ever worked in a small business that is successful, you know how creative they have to be because they don't have all the resources. <laughs> they see a problem, they're flexible enough to do something about it, and they take typically creative actions to do something also. And the fourth thing that they found that is consistent in, in, in good small business people is they're typically good communicators. Not necessarily that they can get up in front of a group such as this evening and, and make a great presentation, et cetera, but at least they have the ability to communicate their ideas to the people that they feel are important, whether it be their employees, their customers, their suppliers, or whomever. So small business <coughs> does an excellent job of, of normally giving these skills to their employees. Why? Because they don't have a marketing department that they can rely on. They don't have a research department that they can rely on, typically. They don't have all the things that come with, the trappings that come with major corporations. And their people have to be flexible. Just to summarize, the importance of small and medium-sized businesses to the U.S. economy has been discussed for many years. But only in the last four or five years has this belief been documented by such proven recognized authority as such as David Birch, Susan McCracken, Michael Teets, and Katherine Armington. Regardless of the source that is utilized, small business is responsible for generating between 70 and 82 percent of all the jobs in the U.S. economy. I think we need to dwell on that for just a second. 70 to 82 percent. The lowest I've seen has been 20, is 70 percent, the highest is 82. So somewhere in between is probably the true point. But that is significant. Seven out of every ten jobs, on a worst case, come from small businesses under 100 employees. As in job creation, the majority of new innovation in the United States is generated by the small business sector. Ninety-four percent of the patents that are issued in the United States are issued to small businesses. I think that is phenomenal. Most of the high-tech innovation in the last ten years has been generated by the small entrepreneurial type businesses. Take a look at just in the 20, year, 20 years ago, Intel, one of the largest manufacturers of microchips in the United States, started out as a true mom and pop type of a business. And today they're one of the high tech businesses of the country. But it's that type of, that type of spirit that starts out very small and seems to mushroom and grow very quick. There is no doubt that the small business community plays a significant role in the U.S. economy. And hopefully with the business community's input can play a much more significant role in the future. When you take a look at the, the small the effort in economic development, whether it be in the city of Muncie, whether it be in Delaware County, the state of Indiana, or in the United States as a whole, I think not enough emphasis is, is aimed at helping the small business succeed. Uh, and I'm not knocking the big business at all. It's great to have General Motors and the 2,000 jobs that they, they bring with it. But I think we also have to, f to do some of the things that are necessary to help our small business communities, uh, our small businesses in our communities to succeed, because that's where the real, the real growth in, in jobs and innovation and I think future technology are going to come from. And if we, the, the, the members of, <coughs> of our communities today, the students are who are going to be the the movers and shakers of the future aren't aware of what the small business community can offer. Uh, I think we've really missed, uh, really missed the boat. And I would challenge all of you, if you're not doing enough in the small business market today, you ought to find out what's going on in, the, in your own community. And you ought to get involved a little bit. Uh, small business people can be a lot of fun. Uh, they can be very innovative. They can be challenging. Uh, sometimes uh, they can be a pain in the rear. <clears throat> but I think that you can learn a lot for the, from, from the small business marketplace, and I challenge you to learn from them, to help them, and we'll all be better off for it. Thank you. <laughs> Don, Don had indicated to me on the phone that if we wanted to, if anybody had any questions, I'd be more than happy to entertain them on anything. Um, yes, I do, and, and not only do I, I quoted a couple times in their Inc. Magazine. Inc. Magazine last year um, rated Indiana number one in the country 
on help to the small business community, the number one state in the country in help to the small business community. Um, I think we've come a long way in the last four years. I think we've got a long way to go, but it's not going to be accomplished overnight. I think through some of the programs that the Department of Commerce has, uh, they were instrumental in helping venture capital get started in the state. They're doing a great job in the Corporation for Science and Technology and in helping to fund new ideas and new innovation. Uh, they're working, uh, doing a great deal through the uh, Indian Institute for New Business Ventures, I think. And they've also awakened a lot of people around the state <coughs> uh, in helping to put together the small business development centers. Uh, so that they're doing a lot of things around the state to make people aware that small business is important. Uh, and I think from, from talking to Lieutenant Governor Muntz, I know he's got a lot, a lot of other plans uh, if he can get them through the legislature. So I think we're lucky that Indiana has, uh, has awakened to the idea that small business is important and is, and is heading in the right direction. What we need to do is, is to get that to trickle down to the local communities and really get the, com the local communities involved. I think that's where the real action is going to take place. And I think the first step is these small business development centers. They're, and Muncie happens to have one, and, and, and I think if they're used right, they're going to have a tremendous impact. What about the success failure rate of small business, uh, say, compared to 10 years ago? We hear something about, what, maybe 50% will be successful after three years, about 50% will, uh, will have failed after three years. Uh, do you foresee a more op an even more optimistic success rate or a more negative rate in terms of degree of success after being in business for a very few years? Um, I've read a lot of those statistics, and I use them a lot. <laughs> but I, I don't know a lot of times that I put a lot of faith in them. Because, uh, uh, for instance, there, the statistics do show that 35% of all businesses fail by the third year, and 52% by the fifth year, and 82% by the second year. But you have to ask the question, what's failure? Uh, and probably the best study that I've ever seen is the University of Pittsburgh study. And, and they did a five-year study of a five-year time frame, and they studied in great depth what failure was. And they basically found that failure is not necessarily bankruptcy and, and things like that. Number one, if you look at statistics, 600,000 new businesses are started a year, and only 50,000 odd businesses go bankrupt. So that means there's still 550,000 businesses out there that are still in business doing something. And what I've found, uh, and the good studies have shown, is that failure is probably more when, when the founder, owner, whomever, whether they started the business, whether they bought it or inherited it or whether, whatever, <clears throat> set certain expectations of success. And, it, and failure really was that they did not meet that expectation and they voluntarily went out of business. Now that means they might shut the place down and, and not, maybe not even broke even. Or they sold it to someone else and, and made a little money or perhaps a few of them did in fact go broke, financially broke. Uh, I think Looking down the road, the small business sector, if seminars are any indication, the small business sector is, sector is clamoring for help to ensure that they won't fail. And I think we're going to see more success, uh, true success, and, and less failure. Uh, the programs like the Indiana Department of Commerce, you know, planning, the whole concept of planning People are finding out how important it is and how if you plan and plan right, you, you improve your chances of success dramatically. So people are, uh, I happen to teach some seminars on strategic planning and they sell out every time you hold them because the small business community wants help. So in, in again, answering your question, I think uh, a lot of the statistics are overblown and I think you'll see a lot more success down the road. Uh, you know, if you look at our economy versus Japan or versus Europe, et cetera, uh, the, revel the revelation or revolution, really, of the entrepreneurial society that's taken place in the last 15 years is just an American phenomenon. You don't find it anywhere else. You're seeing a little bit of it in Europe, but not much. I mean, not Europe, but in, in Japan, but not much. It's still in Japan. Uh, a mother gets very upset in Japan if she has to tell her neighbors that her child has gone to work for some small company because the, the, real, the real sign of success in Japan is to say my child works for Honda or Sony or Mitsubishi 
that is success. So in those economies, <coughs> entrepreneurship has real problems. And that's why their growth in jobs, according to the studies anyway, have not kept track with us. And uh, hopefully we'll keep it up and we'll keep government out of the, you know, you know from interfering, leaving pe leave people alone, uh, untie our hands and things will get better. Don? Can you give uh, a rest of the Certified Development Corporation in Indiana a little bit? Uh, okay. Yeah, what it does. Okay. Uh, the Indiana Statewide Certified Development Company is a corporation which specializes. That's another tool that's helping small businesses grow. Thank you for mentioning that. I get a, a yeah, advertisement here. It's a corporation that specializes in in long-term fixed asset financing for growing businesses, and uh, basically, it's real estate oriented and heavy equipment oriented. The two areas where small business has the most trouble in obtaining financing, and basically, it's a a joint effort of the banking community in the state of Indiana. We are a unique animal in that we are a for-profit corporation. We're owned by 77 banks across the state uh, that have a vested interest in the program. And that's why we think it's so successful. And the Small Business Administration and the, 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 the business itself. And what it does, it provides long-term financing at below market rate <coughs> uh, with smaller down payment with, over a longer period of time. And it really helps the, the small business by reducing its cash outflow originally in a down payment, by improving its cash flow over a long period of time because it, it can spread the payments over a longer period of time. And uh, just in our first year of operation, which was 1984, uh, we, uh, our studies show that we have a direct impact of almost 700 jobs in Indiana. Uh, so those are some of the programs that are taking place now and have will continue to grow. And that, now that's a government sector type of job. Those are the type of programs in my mind where the government should be helping. And it's a good program rather than some of the other things that don't make a whole lot of sense. As you can see, I'm not much pro-government. <coughs> Anyone else? Well, thank you for uh, the invitation to be with you this evening. And have a nice evening. It was in the winter time, and it started to snow about the time he arrived, and it took him about three hours to get home. So I told him, well, at least this time he ought to be able to get home in a reasonable length of time. But thanks a lot, Steve, for, for joining us and with those remarks. And certainly, if, if the goals of Horizon 91 are going to be realized here in Muncie, I think we're going to have to give increasing attention in trying to help our small businesses here in the Muncie area. Some of the things we're doing, Steve mentioned the SBDC is being developed. We're also considering uh, small business incubators and things of this nature, but I think we're going to have to really get behind and push the small business because certainly that's where most of the jobs are, in fact, created. Now, the purpose of Sigma Iota Epsilon uh, is printed on the back of your program. And basically, we are trying to stimulate interest and achievement in the field of management.